Now, the, quite, the problem is for this court is that a majority of the court of those who would be inclined, I think, to be drawn to the notion of, a, of, a, of this kind of liberty interest rather firmly reject that method of analysis, that is, see the dissenting opinions with respect to Roe versus Wade uh, by Justice Scalia uh, and, and by others, so that the notion that you would find a, a right of gun ownership in the liberty clauses is a difficult one for this court, hence the attraction of the, of the, of the second uh, amendment. The, um, so the question will be, is the second amendment uh, the kind of amendment, the kind of protection that is incorporated? You know, I think if you read Justice Scalia's opinion, the answer to that would certainly be, would, you know, would, there's a strong argument that yes, that's exactly the kind of right that, that, that Justice Scalia saw. There is a reading accepted by four of the justices that uh, that, that rights discourse had very little to do with the Second Amendment. Um, that the Second Amendment, which in my view of course creates an individual right, it's invocable in court by litigants. The Second Amendment was adopted by Congress and, prom and sent out to the states for ratification because of a fury that erupted when the new Constitution proposed in 1787 gave the national government the power to first create a national standing army and then gave the national government the power over the state militias. Congress was given the power to arm and organize the state militias. And by arm, the opponents of this overreaching federal authority read the power to disarm. And that was a flashpoint. Congress, no one thought Congress had the power to regulate individual ownership of guns. No amendment was thought necessary for that. But Congress was expressly given the authority in Article I, Section 8 to organize, arm, and, dis, and therefore disarm the state militias. And the, 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 the discourse around the Second Amendment wasn't that individual rights discourse. Uh, now that is the losing argument in District of Columbia versus Heller. Um, but what is, um, what, is, what is interesting, I think, particularly interesting about this, is the very strong argument that the Second Amendment was an important federalism amendment to retain state control, the control of the people in every state over their own militias over how to store their guns, over how to have their militias, over how to do it. That was very fundamentally important. And now what will happen when the court holds that it's, quote, incorporating the Second Amendment and applying it to the states is to turn that upside down. Now the Second Amendment, which was designed to protect state autonomy with respect to guns, will be used as a vehicle for allowing federal judges in the national government to decide what every state and local government can do with respect to uh, its control and regulation of arms. So if you believe the view of the, of the Second Amendment to protect state control over the subject matter from federal interference, it will literally have turned it flatly upside down. Now that's not to say I've always thought that the better argument, I, I, I certainly believe, I think the most disappointing statement made by Judge Sotomayor in her hearings to become a justice was do you believe that the Constitution contains a constitutional right of self-defense. And she did one of those, I couldn't answer that question. To me, the answer is, yes, of course. How could it not have a right of, of self-defense? The contours of that might be debatable, but surely it seems to be a right. That always seemed to me a better place to lodge the argument over whether the the right to possess and use guns was part of that right of self-defense protected by the liberty clauses of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment. And I always thought that the invocation of the, uh, the Second Amendment uh, was a distraction uh, using language from an amendment that's about something altogether different. But let me note, that argument did not prevail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Walter. We're going to move ahead to questions, um, and uh, I'll ask a quick one. It was just going to be like speed dating, where you know, those speed dating shows you see where 
question, bam, answer it, we'll move on so that we can try to get a few in. Um, and so there's a microphone set up over here that we uh, would like for you to use so that uh, we can pick it up and record it. Uh, I'd like to start by asking uh, folks uh, to address very quickly. Um, uh, Chief Justice Roberts said again the other day, uh, invoking others, that every new justice makes a new court. Uh, if that's true, we've had three of them in the last four years, and uh, uh, we might have another one soon. And I'm wondering what uh, you think that that means and what uh, you, you th how you think that affects the courts. Cleta? Well, very quickly, I think that uh, in the certainly in the political law campaign finance arena, it's made a huge difference because Chief Justice Roberts, in his very first um, – challenge, really, very first uh, issue before him, did, a, I thought, a very masterful job. He demonstrated the, his mastery, I think, of internal politics of the court. Uh, the, because the Wisconsin Right to Life case came up, the government argued that um, all of the issues related to Section 203 of the McCain-Feingold had been settled by McConnell, and really argued that there was no room for an applied challenge, because that had been settled. And, and Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts took the court in a very deliberate step-by-step -step direction and um, first said, well, that's ridiculous. And the court, all they agreed that was ridiculous, sent it back for the uh, as-applied facts to be developed and came back up. And then I, I just think he has done a very, he's demonstrated his mastery of internal politics and I think that of the court, and I think this, the fact that he is maneuver, I think that there's been a maneuvering of to get the, at least in my field, get it back to the question of, of we're, that argument in September was, a, the court doesn't do it very often. You know, a case had been submitted and they reopened it to deal with fundamental issues. And I think that that was really, a, that's a demonstration to me of a real mastery of internal politics that didn't exist before he became Chief Justice. Uh, well, we don't know the, the question we want to know the answer to, which is uh, how will Justice Sotomayor influence Justice Kennedy's vote? We just, we just don't know. Uh, but what Justice Sotomayor will do is have a whole new set of interests. Uh, she may want to grant cert in the kind of cases that other justices didn't want to grant cert in. So uh, there may be a resurgence of, of the court's interests in certain areas of law, maybe criminal law, given Justice Sotomayor's uh, background as a prosecutor. Uh, and I think that's probably the biggest impact we'll see in the short term, rather than the question of uh, influence on Justice Kennedy's vote, which we're just going to have to wait and see. Uh, I agree with all that. Not much to add. Uh, I guess I'd just observe that Justice Sotomayor has said some really alarming or somewhat alarming things in some speeches, but in her testimony, she really didn't say anything alarming. In fact, she said virtually nothing that a federal society type could object to. And so we're really left to wonder kind of which is the true Justice Sotomayor, and we're going to get to find that out this year. Uh, <clears throat> on the confirmation hearings, the thing that I found most interesting was her not very veiled repudiation of the president's approach to uh, right. to judging. And uh, you know, she she seems to have embraced the uh, you know the rule of law, almost originalism uh, <laughs> approach to deciding cases, uh, hook, line, and sinker. Walter, I think the replacement of uh, Justice Souter with Justice Sotomayor will have very little consequence on the court as compared with the replacement of Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor by Robert Sinalito. I think it would be much more profound uh, influence uh, on where the court is. <clears throat> Howdy. Thank you, for, thank you for being here today. Uh, this question is most specifically for Mr. Dillinger it's regarding the gun case. Do you think the justice will revisit slaughterhouse cases and get into pri privileges or immunities since this really seems like a privilege of ownership or immunity from prosecution than due process or whatever else? I don't think anyone doubts. Uh, I don't know anyone that believes that slaughterhouse was correctly decided uh, in the sense that its its it, its gutting of the privileges and immunities clause gave it you know far too narrow uh, a reading. Um, I as a place for federal for Congress first of all 